I'm back with that 69 Deluxe Reverb. After a lot of extensive cleaning of the board, which as you can see in the previous video remo involves removing old solder, uh, washing the entire area, really soaking it with isopropyl alcohol, uh, heating it up to drive all the alcohol out, which also pushes out the moisture that's in the board and gets contaminants off the board, then putting everything back with fresh solder. Uh, the DC leakage is gone from all the critical stages. Now, it's normal to get measurements 20 millivolts and under. That's no big deal. It was the stuff that we were getting over 100 millivolts. In some places, it was uh, 200, 300 millivolts. All that's gone. And the amp is uh, so quiet, you can barely hear that it's on. I'm just verifying all the little bits. And uh, in my experience, those last bits of stray voltage that I'm measuring a few places, even those will go away as the board kind of bakes, by which I mean when once the uh, whole thing is in the enclosure and the heat doesn't have any place to go, everything just comes up to a warmer temperature and the last of that moisture will be driven out. Uh, the reverb no longer has that awful noise. Let me get a guitar real quick. Um, it needed a new uh, preamp tube for V2 and V4. Uh, the owner chose or chooses not to use a tube in V1, so he's not using the normal channel at all, which gives a little bit more gain to the uh, reverb channel, the vibrato channel, because they have a shared cathode, and that way that triode gets the full benefit of all that potential gain. Uh, the amp had a 12AX7 in for the reverb driver as opposed to the correct 12AT7. So it's getting a 12AT7 because uh, while an AX will give more reverb to some degree, it drives it, has more voltage. What you really want there is not a voltage provider, but a current provider, and it just wears out a 12AX7 prematurely. So um, I guess it helps if I remember to plug in. I've got my test reverb tank hooked up. We'll be testing the uh, tank in the combo in a little bit. But first, we're going to change the speaker in that because the old speaker is all worn out, the old Oxford. A little out of tune, forgive that. This is going to be short. The amp is sounding really good now. All the noise is gone, the crackle's gone, uh, the sustains improve, the note clarity, the note separation. Once all that stray 60 hertz stuff from the DC, which is also going to be every possible mathematical uh, variant of 60, 120, 240, etc. All, once all that's gone, there's not all this stuff writing all the waveforms. You can actually hear the music that you want. Uh, one quick thing to show before I switch to the speaker changing. This amp uh, has the, the uh, bright cap on the volume. And most players, myself in included, prefer to have that disconnected. I'm going to call the owner real quick and ask about that and see what he thinks. And, you know, the real answer from, from most players' perspective is if you always have the treble four or lower, the amp's too bright, take out the cap. If with the cap and you're cranking the amp to you know, treble to seven or eight, you like it really bright. So it also depends to a degree on what guitars you're using. With a Telecaster, that can be the cause of pain. With a uh, Gibson, particularly a lot of the ones that have the 330K, uh, sorry, 300K uh, pots in them, which tend to be dark, that can add a lot of nice clarity. So it is a case by case basis. And I will ask the owner what he wants. And uh, next, we'll change out the speaker. A couple of things to point out here uh, on this Deluxe. I was about to change out the Oxford and reach these two 
nuts that hold the oxygen in place, you got to pull the reverb tank. And when I did that, I noticed two things that are problematic. Number one, it was installed like this. And the reverbs are much noisier like this. And the tank orientation is the other way. With the jacks facing the front of the amp, they're quieter. That's just how it is. The other thing is that it had no cardboard beneath the old Gibbs tank. And the bag, which, and the inside of this bag has got this soft lining, which is very nice. It's a good quality bag. Also, the bag was not screwed in place and had never been screwed in place. So I will be screwing it in place. But uh, if that soft fabric on the inside contacts these springs, you get no reverb. So I will be adding a bit of cardboard on the bottom just to keep these separated from the tank bag and then screwing the bag in place uh, so that it doesn't flop around. You especially don't want it banging up against the magnet and getting stuck there. And uh, as I mentioned in the first video on this, Oxford had been repaired very poorly. And this one's broken off. This one's hanging on. Oh, just broke because I touched it. Just crappy. Uh, this is not the original wiring. Let's take a look inside under this F cap and see what we see. That is what we call in the business a shitty job. So I'll be redoing that properly as well. Uh, give it some good solder joints and something reliable. When I uh, solder in the uh, new replacement speaker. So I get the, all this out and get started on all that. Nice thing is I don't have to waste my time desoldering this. I'll just desolder this end and reuse this good plug. Old speaker out, I'm about to put the new one in. And I was doing an inspection of the cab and a lot of these screws holding the baffle to the cleats are loose. Let's see if they tighten up. If they don't, I sometimes need to go to a larger screw. That one's not grabbing any wood, just old particle board. The particle board can get water in it and they have problems. Sometimes I can take it off and uh, fill with uh, epoxy or super glue. Those three tightened up just fine. This one, it's not grabbing any wood. One of the other options, which is the one I'm going to do first, is to uh, replace this with the next size up screw. And this looks like it's an eight, in which case I can just go up to a number 10 and maybe grab some wood there. And I've got to run some errands. I'm a Swing by a hardware store. I always, I think I'm out of the right length of this. I think it's one and a quarter, one and a half. Anyway, I'll just take this with me, get the next size up. It's a sheet metal screw, stainless steel. And uh, if that doesn't tighten it up, then I'll remove the baffle and uh, either with, put some epoxy or super glue in here, uh, maybe with some other wood. Anyway, it's fixable. But you gotta be careful, especially when you have water damage, because this particle board, it's, it's a really high quality vintage MDF, which means that it's MDF. It's not the world's best stuff to begin with, and uh, it's really easy to go crumbly. So let's see what we can do to make this last. The other option, uh, which is harder to do, uh, though it's possible, because you gotta do a pre-drill hole from the other side, is just to put a, a new screw in about an inch or so away from the old screw. And that is an acceptable repair, but first I'm going to try to reuse the old hole, just because it's easier <laughs> reuse the old hole. All right, the store did not have the right length of number 10 screws. It's like uh, one and three quarters, one and five eighths. They go to one and a half, and then they go to two. I didn't feel like delaying the whole thing to order some specialty screws, so... Uh, I reached out to some other amp techs I know and to some guys who do woodwork. And uh, many people said that for a simple repair like this, if I were to just stuff the uh, oversized hole with uh, tight bond and toothpicks, 
ought to do just fine. So I have done just that on all four screws. This one took five toothpicks. Toothpicks. This one took four. The other two just took three, and it's all set up now, and seems rock solid. So the cab will not be vibrating. That's crucial. So now it's time to redo the cable for the new speaker. All right. A couple of years ago, someone brought me this pedal to repair, and it was unrepairable. Uh, it would cost more to repair than a new one cost. Just the economics of pedals and labor. And the owner didn't want it, so it's just been around, and I use it as a jig to hold jacks while I'm soldering them. So I'm just going to get this old crappy stuff out. Let me actually separate these strands so I can pull them. That was a terrible, terrible solder joint, as is this. All right, let me take a look at this to make sure this solder that's in here is going to be okay. Yeah, that'll be all right to reattach to. All right, so I've got this wire that I'd like to use. Let me make sure that it fits through here. Yeah, it will. All right. Let me fish this through off camera because I can only do so much looking through the camera lens. All right, use the razor to separate these a little bit. And the one with the stripes will be my negative connection. So when I do the speaker end, I'll be able to see which is ground, which is positive. I'm gonna give that a little bit of a curve. Just kind of pre-bend it. And I'm going to tin the far side of it to keep it from delaminating or having all the strands go in every direction. And I've not tinned the curve, so I can bend this out of my way and shape it where it needs to be. Let me take a look at this and see where it's going to line up. So I need to put the center right, right there, mark it with my thumbnail. Real scientific, right? I'm sure there are more impressive ways to do this. But this always works really well for me. Now notice I have that longer than necessary. If I were to cut that short now and then tend it, I would have tend it, I would have a big lump where the wires want to separate. So if I tend this first. And then cut it. Have a nice even cut. The wires don't go anywhere. Let's see if I can do this on camera the first try. I get that solder really flowing and ready. There's no real mechanical connection here. So you want to get a, as good a solder joint as possible and make sure it's shining. And you don't want um, to overheat it because you can bird nest and you can have the insulation melt. I've tried using those things with all the, the arms with all the joints and the alligator clamps to hold parts. I've done that in the past. I always felt very Rube Goldberg to me, and I don't find it any more secure than this. There we go. All the stars aligned. Make sure that stays while I set it up. All right. Uh, I've also tried bench vices, which um, for most of what I do is overkill both in terms of size and clamping strength. All right, that's the F cap in place. That's a little prone to coming off. 
I think I'm going to take a little bit of clear nail polish. Not a lot. I want it to be finger breakable. Maybe I should, maybe I could use just a touch of type on for this, but I'm gonna give it two spots, two spots only, with some clear nail polish. Won't hurt the plastic. We'll grab the metal, but only a little bit. It can be removed in the future. It's not like I'm using super glue or epoxy or anything. Line that up. Pop that in, and when that sets up in about 15 minutes, that'll be pretty much locked in until someone needs to remove it, but it won't come off and fall off on a gig. Now, I've left a little, about almost 20 inches here. That's a little bit more than I'll need in a deluxe, but I will eyeball that, and then I like to leave a little bit of slack so there's no pressure on here, there's no pressure at the speaker, but not so much that there's a bunch of cable flopping around. But let's get the, uh, let me eyeball that to the chassis um, uh, and the cabinet and see where I need it, to, how long I need to be, trim off any excess, and we'll attach the new speaker to this before putting it in the cabinet. All right, new speaker in place, make sure it's focused. I always like to put a little bit of paper towel beneath the work area and the cone. So if we have any solder drips or splashes, we don't get a piece of metal lodged in the cone and nothing gets ugly. All right. So again, separate these down at the other end. And I'll probably do a little wire tie to this bit of the frame, uh, which will make it kind of like that and give it some strain relief. But first of all, let me just get this on here. All right, I'm going to take about that much off each one. By the way, the length of the cable right now is 16 inches precisely, which gives me just enough slack. You know, enough slack. It's not any, it's not just enough, but it, I think it's the right amount of slack in a deluxe reverb. I have gone shorter in the past, and people have said it's harder to deal with. If it's long, things flop around, and that's not your friend. Anyway, I've got both of them stripped back the same amount. All the wires are twisted. Now I uh, pretend just the ends. Let's see if I can show this so that when I bend them, the wires won't uh, splay out in different directions. I'm not putting any, any tinning where my bend's gonna be here or here. Now there are a lot of ways to do this. This is how I do it. I've had no failures and it's reversible it's undoable but will not come loose unless someone really wants it to i'm trimming off the thicker part of the end of those 10 sections All right. this is why i don't tend the entire length of the wire i want to have that flexibility there. So we have a good wrap and a mechanical connection. And even without solder at this point, this speaker would make sound. Uh, but both for reliability and because over time, yuck would get into that, onto those metal surfaces. The solder not, is not there primarily to hold things, though it does help. The solder is there primarily to ensure that none of the metals involved get any corrosion or any uh, 
there's nothing in between the metals. This metal is contacting this metal, and the only thing in between them is just a bit of more metal from the solder. And so oxygen cannot get in there, dirt cannot get in there, humidity, etc. And uh, I hope you saw all that. I wasn't looking through the lens, but that's a reliable connection. And uh, I'll do a quick cable tie right there just to keep any strain off of these. Make sure I don't contact the wire leads going from the terminals to the speaker phone, which can be fragile. They don't need any pressure on them. So. Is this lovely what I'm doing here? No. Does it potentially save someone's butt at a gig? Yes. The old Jensen's and other speakers and vintage fenders often had uh, little clips that would be screwed into a hole on the frame to do the same thing. Most new speakers don't have such mounting uh, points, but this certainly works. And, uh, you know, it's not as pretty as I'd like, but no one's going to see this, but they'll certainly hear it if your speaker comes disconnected on a gig. And here this won't happen, at least not at this end. All right. Back in, it's oriented like this because uh, I have found from past experience that if I have this part of the frame, one of the solid pieces over here where this terminal is, it can contact the uh, um, output transformer. So by having that gap there, you should miss that. And uh, if, I, if I had control over Judgment Day, these stickers, sorry, would come separate. I could apply it to the amp, to the speaker afterwards and get it oriented vertically just right. But I don't have control over Judgment Day. I, the 69, they don't have Keps nuts. They have uh, tooth washers and standard uh, 6x32 nuts. So it's very important on these old fenders that there not be any resistance or cross-threading because if uh, there's cross-threading, the entire screw will back out to the other side. It can actually back out all the way through the uh, grill cloth. So I certainly start them by hand. Sometimes I'll do them almost all the way by hand. And then I'm very cautious when I do go to a socket uh, to, vary the, uh, to go with very low torque until they're all even. And then past that point, I'll give them just a little bit more torque. I have attachments on my power screwdriver for such things. It would save me a couple of minutes. I do not use it because even, see that one's loose. This one is physically loose in the cabinet. And even if I were to use the lowest torque setting on the power screwdriver, I would have no feel for it. I might, I might not have noticed that this one was loose, the screw. Now, if, I, if my stars all line up just right, I'll be able to do this. See, the, the, the screw itself is spinning, and um, the nut will hold the screw in place. If the stars don't line up, see how much that pulled up? If the stars don't align, I'll have to take this out and try some super glue or epoxy on the screw where the wood has given way. But this one now, the screw itself should hold that screw into the baffle because the other side of the screw, it's got a larger surface area. This should do the trick. But that's a great re uh, example of why I would not use a power tool for this. I would not have felt that happening with a power tool. And by the time I realized what was happening, it might have back the screw out and push it to the other side. This one's also loose. And uh, these, this uh, pair of needle noses does not have any uh, grip on the inside, it's flat. So I'm not gonna be marring the threads of this screw as I do this. And yeah, I hate that this takes a long time to do such a simple thing. What I really hate is that if 
fender use these screws mounted from the other side through MDF and many many amp and cab companies have copied that and so we still have these screws that over time lose their grip and want to push out. If I were building a custom cabinet I would use T-nuts or other high quality threaded inserts and I would not use MDF I would use Baltic birch. Here's another one which is much more likely to retain its grip over the years. Uh, modern Fender reissues and blue series use some form of MDF, I think. Maybe it's plywood, I think it's MDF. And they just screw into it with wood screws. Which is not ideal, but it is fixable because the wood screws are going from this side down into the wood, not coming from the other side through uh, the baffle. But modern fenders are only designed to last about two seconds past the warranty, which is what, a year, two years? Meanwhile, this one from 1969 Everything that's wrong with it is fixable. And when I'm done with this app, hopefully later this today, hopefully later in this in this video, the uh, amp will be every bit as good as new. The real solution for this baffle, this MDF baffle, which has all these loose screws, and I had to do the tighten up the holes in the cleats, et cetera, et cetera, where, where the cleats go, is a new uh, plywood baffle. And I've done that on the 72 Deluxe Reverb not long ago, a new plywood baffle from, from Mojo Tone. Because the, the pine cabinets in these things are great. It's the uh, MDF, as you can tell, that sucks. All right. Uh, since the screws themselves want to move, I cannot use my standard socket wrench kind of thing for this uh, because I would just end up spinning the screw. So I've got to get out a small handheld one so that I can adjust, I can be pulling the threaded portion up at the same time. So let me pause this and get that tool out. All right, I'm just going to show one of these because it takes a long time to do these by hand. But I've got my 11 32nd low profile. I'm pulling up on the screw by hand at the same time that I'm tightening this nut. Let's see if I can get it any, any closer by hand. Wrong end. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. But I can. And that, that's what matters. So. Now, once I get these tight, the entire thing will be holding it into the baffle and should be good until the next time it needs a speaker, which could be hopefully decades. I've not had any failures with the G12Cs. It's a 75 watt speaker being put into a 22 watt amp. And that 22 watts is measured clean. And people often drive these things dirty which means that they can put out more than 22 watts. And I have had people blow 30 watt speakers with these things. If you only ever play clean, then yeah, you can use a 25, 30 watt speaker with one of these. But if you're playing with overdrive, I would suggest going up to at least 50 watts. Anyway, let me pause this here and do the rest of these by hand because this is riveting, riveting to watch one eternity later all right that's all secure and you know in theory i just deferred part of the repair to the next guy should the speaker ever get changed out but uh you know with vintage amps it is what it is the real solution to this is replacing the baffle and that's just the cost 
uh, that it's not necessary to incur just yet. So I'm going to put the uh, chassis in and uh, hook up the reverb tank. I'm not going to do all the stuff with the, uh, the bag and the cardboard for the reverb tank yet because I want to make sure that it's working before I do any work on that because we may be changing it. It's been banging around for decades in this old app and we'll see if it works. Remember at the beginning of the video, I pointed out that the reverb tank was installed backwards as far as noise goes. And uh, they helpfully put this red tape on the chassis and, and the uh, RCA uh, reverb cables to show how to connect it. And that was to show the wrong way to connect it. So now that it's connected properly, the red's in the wrong place. And while the reverb tank works, this reverb cable here is intermittent. Now I have, I just happen to have some uh, braided metal cables that I will be putting in place and uh, hopefully all will be well. Sometimes this stuff can be fixed, but a lot of times about when this starts to happen, the center conductor wire on these is just kind of crappy and fragile. And it's better just to replace the cable. It's not a ground that's broken, it's the center. So let me uh, change out those cables and uh, then we'll see what it sounds like. One little fast thing to add on to this video before we do the real playing test. Listen to the background noise of this amp and listen to what happens when I secure the chassis to the cab. Actually, I can just demonstrate it before I secure it. Here's the background noise with the chassis not secured to the shielding on the inside of the cab. As far as the other white noise goes, I've got some old tubes and I have the replacements in the mail. They might be here already. I got some boxes in yesterday I need to check. But.